chapter 9, we have a prophecy concerning what's called eschatology. And eschatology is the doctrine of last things, and it just simply means what's going to take place uh, from hereafter up to and including uh, rapture, the, uh, the coming of the eternity. And so we have that recorded for us in the book of Daniel, a very prophetic book. If you remember the first portion of the book had a lot of history about Daniel and about his uh, friends that were taken into captivity and it had some prophecy. And then uh, this, uh, at the end of the book, there's 12 chapters, is prophetical in nature. And so in Daniel chapter 9, the Bible says in verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. This is the Medo-Persia Empire that took over the Babylon, Babylonian Empire. And it wasn't a surprise to Daniel because he had already seen that. It was going to take place. It was part of that the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and the image that uh, he had. And so Daniel understood that this was going to take place. It was not a shock to him. This is after that has taken place. Now the Medes and Persians are in charge of the kingdom. And uh, the Lord is uh, speaking to Daniel. Now, in verse 2, the Bible says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. This is written in the book of Jeremiah, and Daniel had a copy of the Bible, the scriptures, as he went into captivity, and he was a student of the Word of God, so he, he studied that, probably studied that fresh and new, especially as that truth jumped out to him. And uh, the truth of the Word of God uh, jumps out to you fresh and new as you study it, and the Lord gives you uh, new illumination on the truth that is already there, he gives that to you as you need it, as you spend time with Him, and it'll make the Word of God come alive for you. So certainly this was of great interest to Daniel because he realized that he was already in this captivity for about 68 of those years. So it was a, just a short time left, probably about two years left of this desolation. Why was the desolation of Jerusalem mentioned in the book of Jeremiah? You understand that when they were coming into the, uh, the promised land that uh, God told uh, Moses in the book of the law, first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, that uh, they were allowed the land to rest, fallow, uh, at the uh, end of uh, the, the Sabbath. So every seven years they were to allow the land to rest. And uh, they didn't do that. So they were going to uh, allow it to rest for 70 years now for where they had not allowed the land to rest. They had gone into captivity for sinning against God, but the Bible mentions that they had not allowed the land to rest, so God was going to remove them from that land and allow that to happen. So Jerusalem would be uh, desolate, if you will, because of the siege of Babylon upon it, and this is spoken of in the book of Jeremiah. Daniel's reading the book, he understands this truth, and then when he understands that truth, then in verse 3, he begins to pray. And he begins to pray, uh, the Bible says in verse 3, <coughs> from verse 3 through verse 19, he, we have Daniel's prayer, and I believe that I have read that in its entirety last week, and so we're not necessarily going to read it in its entirety, but there's certain portions of that prayer that is you know, evident that it follows along kind of the model or framework that the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray. In the New Testament, you read where the Lord Jesus in a certain place he was praying, and when he ended his prayer, the disciples came up and said, Lord, teach us to pray. As John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. And the Lord Jesus says, when you pray, it's always expected that a child of God will pray. And uh, 
He says, when you pray, you pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's an addressing of God the Father. And he says here that I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication for fasting and sackcloth and ashes, verse 3. He says in verse 4, And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and made my confession, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. So he is addressing God in his prayer. And I'm not saying that when you pray, you have to do a lot of flowery words and repetition in words, but it is going to God with the proper heart that God is the creator God. And I have told you before that uh, it is dishonoring. It is dishonoring to me when I hear somebody say the big man upstairs. Well, he's God. And it, it's hard knowing that God is God, that he is in control, and we're not. And he is the creator God, the sustainer God, and it is going to him in the heart, knowing that uh, he is God, knowing that one day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is God. So there is praise to God in his prayer. He comes fasting, sackcloth, ashes. It's a voluntary act of humility and contrition. This means a godly sorrow, that when you approach God, there is a, a godly sorrow, and there is a humbling of self. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace, that you may uh, receive grace and help in time of need. But there doesn't mean that you rush brashly into the throne room of God. It is uh, seeking God, and it is seeking God in an act of humility. And it is acknowledging God for who He is. It is a holy, reverential fear of God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it is uh, admitting, acknowledging, at least from the heart, who God is, and knowing that from the heart He is creator, sustainer. And then it is a confession of personal sins. If an individual approaches God with known sin in their heart, then the Bible says that uh, the Lord won't hear. It's not that He can't hear, it's that He will not hear if we regard a transgression or iniquity in our hearts. So if an individual is uh, living in, living with, committing known sin, then we have to address that first before that we make our petitions known. When you read the, the prayer of Daniel, he is admitting and confessing the sins of his nation. He is saying in this prayer that uh, God gave to Moses the book of the law and what Israel was supposed to do, that they didn't do it. And then he sent uh, prophets, be times or often, and they didn't do it. So there's national sins. Within it, he also confesses his personal sins. Israel has sinned. I have sinned. America has sinned. America is sinning. And I sin. And we are confessing our sins. And he confesses his personal sins. The confession of national sins. And then in verses 16 through 19 is where the uh, petition of his uh, prayer to God is made. In verse 16, the Bible says, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from <coughs> thy city, Jerusalem. So up until that point, there is the confession of sins, of iniquity. And then in 16 and on, he's speaking about the righteousness of God. And he says, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city, from thy city, Jerusalem. That's in verse 16. And you could uh, utilize that and many other passages to allow you to know that uh, the Lord does get angry. And he, the Bible says, is angry with the wicked every day. And when the Lord looks down at the wickedness of man, it uh, brings a, a holy indignation. He is uh, angry with that. Verse 16, he says, Thy holy city, because of our sins and 
for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and I people are become a reproach to all that are about us. That is where they pick up the, the byword. The Jewish people became a byword and other places so that they were God's people. They were to be a holy people. They were to be a righteous people. And so is the Christian to be that way. And they are become a reproach to all that are about us. Verse 17, now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause his face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. And the sanctuary, speaking about the temple, speaking about the temple there in Jerusalem, that would be like an unto day. For us, our meeting place is the house of God, the church of the living God, because the Lord has always had a meeting place for his people. He says in verse 18, O oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations in the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. This is the great mercies of God that we are presenting our supplication, asking forgiveness and asking help from the Lord. Verse 19 it culminates where he says, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. So this is the prayer that uh, Daniel uh, makes in chapter 9. So we wrote here that there is uh, kind of three segments to this, but it's not mechanical, I'm not suggesting that Prayer be mechanical. Prayer is you talking to your Heavenly Father, but you ought to engage in prayer. And when you engage in prayer, there, there are certain, uh, there, there, there's a framework to it in, in praying to God. You recognize that God is real. God manifests Himself in three persons. That's God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And you're allowed to approach the living God in prayer. You do not have to go to somebody to pray for you, but as a child of God, you can enter into prayer uh, with God. And you are to do that and talk to Him as your Heavenly Father. But within it, it is uh, there is a framework, if you will, if you want to hear uh, from God and if you want God to hear and answer your prayer. And certainly you cannot regard iniquity in your heart. You have to confess your sins and forsake your sins. Where the Bible says that we forgive others um, their debts. And so there is a praise to God for who he is. And it's uh, praising God or hallowed be thy name. It's praising God for who he is. And then there is penitence or asking forgiveness sins. We said this would be like on a Wednesday night, I believe it was, we talked about preparation. In the very practice of prayer, it is acknowledging God for who He is and His attributes. His greatest attribute is His holiness. God is holy. We want to capitalize on the fact that His greatest attribute is love. And He is a God of love. God is love. But His greatest attribute is His holiness. And uh, his achievement will be that God will get to glory. And God will get to glory. God gets to glory whenever an individual gets saved. Because it is indicating that his son's work on the cross was not in vain. God gets to glory when the word of God goes forth. Whether it is received or rejected, it has accomplished that which he has sent it out to do. And God has given us a free will. There's, there's penitence or sorrow for sinning against God. This is godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is good. Worldly sorrow is bad. Godly sorrow worketh repentance not to be repented of. But worldly sorrow, it worketh death. The difference between godly sorrow and that repentance and worldly sorrow, godly sorrow is from the heart that you recognize who God is and that all sin is primarily against God and that you have sinned and that uh, when you sin, it was an affront to God Holy Spirit of God brings that to your mind, and uh, there is a, uh, a holy 
guilt for the moment of, of sinning against God and asking God to forgive you of your sin, and then you're cleansed from that by the grace of God. And uh, if, if there is uh, guilt after confession, then it's the, the devil bringing that up to you. But the Holy Spirit of God works on the sin that you're committing now. The Holy Spirit of God brings to your remembrance the sin you're committing now. The devil works on the sin that you already confessed. That's the difference. The sin, the sin that he brings up to you now is to stop you from serving God. You already confessed that. You forsake that. You're forgiven of that. The Holy Spirit of God would touch you on your heart of something that you're doing right now. That's the difference. And when we confess and forsake that sin, he is faithful just to Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then the petition is made known. So we just put this up there. It's not like a mechanical one, two, three, but it is from the heart that you want forgiveness from God. Well, then forgive others. If you, if you want forgiveness from God, but you hate everybody else, then you may not get forgiveness of God. He said that you are to forgive others, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And so you practice forgiveness. And then uh, you, you practice doing what is right as the Holy Spirit of God has, has told you in your heart to do that. And so these are all difficult things, but the Holy Spirit of God gives us the power and wherewithal to do that. So it's praise and penitence and petition, and you see that in, in Daniel's prayer. As Daniel was praying from verses uh, 20 through 27, the, the rest of the chapter, then Daniel gets an answer to prayer. It's a divine answer, and it's from the angel Gabriel. We mentioned that there are basically three angels that are named in the Bible, and Gabriel seems to be the announcing angel, like when the Lord Jesus was birthed, or even before that he was given birth, or Mary gave birth to the Lord Jesus, there's the announcing angel, and here his name is named. And then Michael is the archangel, is the fighting angel who fights against uh, Satan. And Satan is an angel that uh, he, he lost his standing. He is a created being. And he was the, the cherub that covered, the cherub that covered. Most would say that he was the <coughs> song leader, the music leader in heaven because he has corrupted music. And when he fell, he took a third of the angelic host with him that became demons. And they, they cause you much trouble. We'll talk about that later, not today. But those are three angels that are mentioned directly in the Bible. And so the angel Gabriel gave him an answer uh, to this. He says, and whilst I was speaking, verse 20, and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. You'll notice again in Daniel's prayer that he is praying for the nation of Israel, basically for the Jew and uh, for uh, their welfare and for God's glory. Throughout it, I, I'm, I'm sure that he, you know, he prayed for his daily sustenance, but you don't see him praying, Lord, get me out of this captivity. But it, it, he was a praying man. And so that, that's why every child of God is encouraged to pray for America and pray for your church. It, it's God's church. It's Christ's church. And, and God likes to hear that you're interested in that. He says in verse 21, uh, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. This was an evening set time for the Jews of when they prayed. They had, they had set times. And uh, the child of God does not have necessarily a set time. And the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Pray without ceasing. To be in communication with uh, God your Father or be talking to Him. Talk to God your Father. And when you talk to God your Father, you and I as children of God need to be intent on uh, God our Father as we see Daniel here was. And we've mentioned this before and you may have had it done to you or even practiced it. 
that uh, if somebody is addressing you, that they are speaking with you and they're uh, kind of uh, speaking right with you. They're not speaking uh, to you, but looking over here to somebody else. Or they're not speaking with you, but really they're not even hearing what you're saying because their mind's over here on something else and they're just kind of, you know, doing your lip service. Well, God knows that. And a lot of people say, well, God knows all about it. Yeah, God knows all about it. But yet it's not an excuse. God knows all about my sin. God knows my heart's with you. God knows, yeah, God knows, but is it really there? And so there is that, you know, you're speaking to God the Father. So he is speaking, and God the Father answers him through the man, Gabriel. He says he caused him to fly swiftly. Do angels have wings? <laughs> so uh, you, you can pick stuff apart and see these things. There's, a, there's the cherubim. There's a couple of angels that are mentioned of having uh, wings uh, in the Bible, but... Uh, they don't need wings. No. They don't need wings. They can fly. When, when you get your glorified body, you'll be able to pass through doors like Jesus did. You don't have that yet, but you will. And, and the Bible limits some of the things, but it gives us enough things to, to understand and know. And so, uh, uh, not being mean about anybody that has lost loved ones, but little babies don't become angels when when they die they, little babies don't become angels they are people angels were created beings and angels look into the church service angels make a wonder why somebody don't get saved or why god would even save us angels can't get saved they either have fallen and are demonic or they already are uh, holy. In other words, they either chose or they didn't choose, but they can't choose later to say, I want to get saved. They don't. They are angelic beings at his bidding. But you and I are the crown creation. You don't think that, but we are. And the Genesis account <laughs> says that. And we are the very crown of his creation. You were created with a will. You were created with an innate a desire. There is a light within you to know God and to be able to do God's bidding. And that if you do it, there will be more reward for you uh, later in heaven than you can picture now. The devil wants you to see that. And so he calls this angel to be able to move swiftly over to Daniel. And, and you will have a glorified body in heaven. That's after the rapture. We'll talk about that later. And he <coughs> says, uh, I am now come forth to give thee. I'm sorry, verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me. He said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. And I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. And uh, you're greatly beloved as well. God loves you. In verse 24 through uh, 27 is eschatology. In 24 through 27 describes everything that took place from when he got the answer to the prayer till uh, the end. And some of it has taken place and some of it has not taken place. And so many people speak about this in uh, you know, prophetic terms and so forth. The word is eschatology or the doctrine of last things. So, you know, psychology is talking about people and their thinking and all of that. Well, eschatology is the doctrine of last things. So anyone would be, uh, they would love to be able to tell the future. A lot of them try to make money off of it and so forth. But the Bible student can know. Sometimes it seems like uh, that some people are not interested in it. But the Bible student that wants to know, and Daniel received it and he gives it to us, you can know what's going to take place in the future. You know this. And God doesn't give us uh, 
the numbers to the, the mega uh, ticket to, to win the lottery, but it does tell you what's going to take place. And it's throughout the Word of God. So it's called Daniel's 70th week. And you've heard this a lot, I'm sure, but in Daniel's 70th week, part of it is past. In fact, the, the greatest portion of the prophecy is actually past, but some is in the future. What Daniel didn't see and what the Old Testament prophets did not see is the church age that you're living in. Always remember prophetic terms, mountain peaks. Right here and over to that mountain peak, they seen that. And this is what was going to take place soon. That was what was going to take place way on down the road of peace. But they did not see the church age that's in between. And that's where you and I live. Now, when he says this, he says in verse 24, Seventy weeks are determined upon my people and upon my holy city, so it's upon the Jews in Jerusalem, to do what? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision of prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. I think there's six things there. That's what's going to take place in the 70-week 70, uh, 70 uh, prophecy. To finish the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. So you see transgression, sins, and iniquity that are spoken of here. I'm not going to pick these terms apart, but uh, we, we have, they are like kind with similarities, and then there is some differences. Transgression is simply uh, whatever is against the law. Transgression is the breaking of the law, and um, uh, sins, Iniquity. Iniquity has to do with the sin nature. It means uh, twisted. And uh, sins, transgression, it can it means out of bounds, miss the mark. Sin means you miss the mark. Transgression, out of bounds. And then uh, iniquity is the sin nature itself. And so how is this going to take place? And to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal of the vision of prophecy and anoint the most holy. Speaking about the fact that uh, the Lord Jesus, the what he did on the cross, that uh, he, he paid the sin debt and the anointing of the most holy, the Lord Jesus Christ is the most holy, and he is king of kings and lord of lords. He is king of kings, lord of lords now, but uh, one day then he will be recognized as that because he's not recognized as that as it is today. But one day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. And so these are six things that you could look at here. In Daniel's 70th week, we understand 69 weeks have been accomplished. Now, the, the, the weeks are years. The weeks are sevens of seven years. And so it's not seven days like we would, would speak about. They are, uh, they are years of time. And uh, one week is left. So 69 weeks of years have been accomplished. And one week is left. And it is called the time of Jacob's trouble. That's in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Now, notice here before we get ahead of it. And verse 25, the Bible says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks. So in verse 24, he says, 70 weeks have been, have been determined upon the people. The 70 weeks are 70 of uh, seven years. If you do your math, it means 490 years have been determined. Now he breaks it down. He says that in verse 25, that uh, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Verse 25 breaks down two of those uh, portions into uh, seven weeks and then 62 weeks. So he says one of these portions is seven weeks and one of those portions is 62 weeks. He says this is going to start when they announced to go forth and start rebuilding the temple. They hadn't announced that yet. Daniel's into captivity. He realizes that 70 years 
have been determined in the desolations because of the, the land, the breaking of the Sabbath of the land for disobedience. And uh, he's, he's starting to think. He said, like, well, I'm in like the 68th year. They only have two years left. And so he's praying for that. And so the, and, uh, Daniel gets another message from Gabriel and says uh, to him that uh, these 70 weeks have been determined. It's 490 years. He says, now this is going to start up when the decree goes forth to start rebuilding Jerusalem. The Jerusalem hadn't been starting to be rebuilt yet. So there's a ray of hope. Daniel's praying. Okay, so Jerusalem's going to get rebuilt. There's going to be a decree to go forth and rebuild Jerusalem. And this is when this is going to start. Now, in this 70 weeks, the 70th week that has not taken place yet, is yet to take place, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. It's called the tribulation. That's what we would call it today. It's mentioned in Matthew chapter 24, 21 through 29, and so forth. It's time of tribulation. This tribulation time is also broken down into two parts. And uh, before I get ahead of that, we'll continue on here, but it's called the time of tribulation. And it has started, the tribulation, after the rapture. And that's Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And so as we study the Word of God, you take each of those bits and you learn as much as you can on each of those bits within the time frame of attention span. The first three chapters of the book of Revelation have to do with the church age of which you and I are living right now. It has to do with that valley. So Daniel's way back here in the Old Testament and he sees um, this peak and that peak. This peak would happen pretty soon with a man named Antiochus Pythias, and that took place. He desolated the temple, offered a sow, a swine, female swine, and made a desolation. He'll be mentioned again. And then he sees way on down the road of peace to the next peak that has not happened yet, which is the time of Antichrist. That's what you and I will witness. We well, didn't see the church age in between. The church age in between is Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3. In Revelation chapter 1, and we were looking at that the other night, in chapter 1, Jesus gives kind of a summary of his attributes and how his summary of his attributes can help you as an individual Christian and how he helps those churches. In chapter 2 and chapter 3 is the church age of seven churches. God does work in sevens. And in those seven churches, it is seven real churches, and he mentions them in kind of what uh, takes place is what he would praise them for and then what they need to work on. There's at least one of those churches where he didn't have anything negative to say, but he gives part of his attribute to each of those churches in relation to what is wrong in the church. And you can look at that again and you can say that even within my life, something that needs to be worked on, there's an attribute of Christ that would pertain to that as well. When you get to Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, the words are there that say, uh, come up hither. That's the rapture. And so it's when the rapture takes place that the tribulation starts. The tribulation is the trigger of Daniel's 70th week. Now, I, I said all that and, and put that all out there quick. You get a hold of, you grab as much of that as you can, and then as you study and put it all back together, it, it, it begins to, to make all, all of the Bible kind of mesh together for you. So as you study the Word of God, you, you see each of those pieces and then how they mesh and then how you fit into it. And one trip through doesn't do it. You have to make trip after trip after trip through the Word of God. Uh, Daniel was a man of God. He was a man of prayer. He's in captivity. And he's studying the book of Jeremiah, and all of a sudden it came back alive to him. It says, hey, 68 of those years are done, and I've got two years left. He starts praying about it, and as he prayed, there's another truth there. As he prayed, he was making supplication, he was praying for 
uh, his nation for his own sins. And because he did, God gave him more revelation. And God gives the child of God more illumination of what's already there when you demonstrate you're interested in what God is saying. But if you're not interested in what God is saying, then he's not on our bound to, to tell you. But if you're like, I'm interested in what's going on, I see what's going on, and I want more of what's going on, then he'll, he'll talk to you. Now, he doesn't give you new revelation. All he does is shine a light on what's already there. And it, it's in the, in the Word of God. So it starts out with rapture. The Jewish nation of Israel has been set aside for a time. I'm not going to take time to go there. I just put it out there. It's Romans chapter 11, verse 25. We tell every new Christian and every returning Christian to read two books to get started. And every one of you know what they are. We tell them to read the book of John and read the book of Romans. You need to do it, you need to do it again and again and again. The book of John tells you that Jesus is, is God in the flesh, deity. The book of Romans allows you to understand that you're saved, and it's very doctrinal indeed. And so the individual, that's the thinker, says, well then, well, what about the Jews? God is not done with the Jews. But in, in Romans chapter 11, they have been set aside. It's actually from chapter 9 through 11 that they have been set aside. It says, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The fullness of the Gentiles being fulfilled. There's the times of the Gentiles, there's the fullness of the Gentiles. In this particular case, the fullness of the Gentiles being fulfilled. What's that mean? It means when the last person that's going to get saved in the age of grace takes place, then that's the end of the church age. And he says, come up hither. And, and then it's, it's looking like that. All signs are pointing towards that. And that is when God's time table, time clock, starts clicking, starts going again, and the time of the tribulation, I know that there will be Gentiles here, but in its whole form, it's God's final dealing with the Jews. And uh, so Daniel's 70th week, the timetable started with the decree to rebuild. That's Nehemiah chapter 2, so you'll see how Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther come in. They're not all disconnected books. So, uh, Nehemiah was uh, the cupbearer, and there he was in the captivity, and he gets news. Hey, Jerusalem is burnt down, the gates and so forth, and God lays on his heart to rebuild or to do something. And God does that today. God, God lays it on people's hearts to do something. So, he laid it on Nehemiah's heart. Well, there was a decree to go and rebuild. It was from a heathen king, but God said he would raise up Cyrus and, and, and make this take place. It's mentioned like a 950 years before Cyrus was ever even born. And that is the, the timetable that starts. 70 times seven or 409 years. All right, so he said there was seven weeks or 49 years, that was the rebuilding of the temple. That's why it's broken down into two parts. He says, and know therefore, verse 25, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, uh, seven weeks. So he first says seven weeks. It's 49 years from the time of the decree to go rebuild and the rebuilding of the temple was 49 years. It took 49 years, and that's why it was stated as such. From the time they were released to go back there and rebuild, you know, Nehemiah built the walls. There was the, the building of the temple, and there was uh, some uh, evil things that took place, the halting of it, and then within the walls there was the sand ballot, Tobiah. You always got somebody trying to restrict uh, the work of God. There was the sand ballot, Tobiah. You can read it. And then uh, 62 weeks, which is 434 more years after the rebuilding of the temple until it says Messiah was cut off. That's talking about the crucifixion of Christ. He says, uh, verse 26, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And that means crucified. But not for himself. It means not for his own sins. And the people of the prince that shall come, and that's talking about the prince of the power of the air, 
shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and under the end war, desolations, and determined. And that's not speaking about Antiochus Epiphanes. That's talking about the Antichrist that is going to take place. And so there was uh, 49 years in rebuilding the temple, and then 434 more years after that, the crucifixion of Christ. That's 483 years. That's from the decree given to the crucifixion of Christ, not for his own sins. That is past. At the crucifixion of Christ, then, and death, burial, and resurrection, the time clock stopped. The Jews, they didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And God said, okay. And it has been. Demonstrations like Hitler have shown that. But the time clock stopped. They rejected their Messiah. And it is the church age right now. It is the present age. It's not seen in the Old Testament. The 70th week will begin after the rapture takes place. Now, I'll read through this and just visit it uh, real quickly next week. But notice this, verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is Antichrist, not Christ. It's Antichrist. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Antichrist will make a peace pact with the Jews for one week. That's seven years. That's the 70th week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, or three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. This is like Antichrist's epiphany, but it is the Antichrist... And for the overspreading of abomination, she shall make it desolate. This is where the Antichrist will go into the temple of God, setting himself up as he is God, and so forth, and demand worship. Even to the consummation, and that determines shall be poured upon the desolate. It simply is talking about uh, the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation and what takes place. And so just one more slide as we end here. The 70th week of Daniel, there was uh, the seven weeks or 49 years... 445 B.C. This was when the decree came that says, Jews, you can go back and rebuild the temple. That is because the, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turneth it whithersoever he will. He used a heathen king to allow the Jews to go back and start rebuilding. It took uh, 49 years to do that. Then there was 62 weeks or 434 more years until the cross. When the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified or cut off, Messiah shall be cut off. And that was AD 70, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. He, he was cut off, at, his age was 33, but in AD 70 was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman Emperor Titus. And so then you live in this gap or the church age. The 70th week is what is going to take place, and it is... The, when the church is raptured out, Revelation chapter 4, 1, and then there are seven years, and that seven years is broken into two, and we'll dig into that a little bit deeper uh, as we go. And so that is Daniel chapter 9, very quick, but there, there's a lot of information there. 69 weeks have passed, the 70th week is yet to come, we're living in the church age, Let's study the Word of God, do the Word of God, and, uh, and know that exciting time to lay that all we're to do is do what God tells us, and He'll bless because of it. We appreciate you being here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the study of the Word of God and how it gives us encouragement. Help us to keep going. We're praying for the service that follows in Jesus' name.